Hello my fellow Nightcrawlers, and welcome to a brand new video. As usual, grab your blankets and grab your snacks and get comfortable, because today, we're going to be looking into horror movies that were actually inspired by true events. That's probably my favorite part in any horror movie, like they're ramping up the suspense with all the creepy intro segments, and then just BAM, based on a true story. It's like, um, I'm terrified now. Also, I didn't feel like this had to be mentioned, but I'm literally going to be talking about the movies. So there might be some spoilers. Surprisingly enough, when you talk about movies, generally speaking, you're going to be having a few spoilers. But disclaimer, I guess, if you didn't think that was going to happen. Before we hop in the video, though, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment, because I'm trying to get to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and only you guys can make that happen. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, let's hop into the video. This first movie should have kind of been obvious. I feel like this one is the most widely discussed based on a true story movie out there. And that's the movie called The Strangers. The Strangers basically dives into a home invasion scenario as a couple tries everything that they can to survive. The movie is very high energy and contains a lot of tension and suspense. I feel like you all would greatly enjoy it. The movie also all strictly takes place inside the home, so there's a lot of claustrophobia that gets built up throughout the movie's runtime. It really adds to the suspense. This movie actually pulls from a lot of different things to have the based on true events label. The first line of inspiration actually comes from the Manson family murders of 1969. In The Strangers, home invasion is quite literally the biggest plot point of the entire movie. So that actually directly ties into the death of actress Sharon Tate. Charles Manson ordered his cult to commit the fatal attack on the actress. There are a lot of echoes from this that appear very heavily within the film, such as the utilization of knives in the movie and the home invasion aspect. The next line of inspiration actually comes from the 1981 Ketty Cabin attacks. I actually did a video on this myself somewhere around my face, so I'm not going to go into too heavy of detail on this, so here's the long and short. To keep it simple, two unidentified individuals broke into cabin 28 and took four lives within that cabin that night. To this day, the case remains unsolved, and even 40 years later, no motive has been established. The biggest tie to the true story and to the movie is the fact that the people who committed the act were never identified. Just like how in the movie, the attackers are never identified. They never really take off their masks. The final point of inspiration actually comes from the director's life story. Brian Bertino told about a night in which he was home alone as a child. Some stranger walked up to the door, knocked on it, and then was asking for someone that lived there. The thing is though, is that this person didn't even live there at all. He would only later learn that there were people actually robbing houses by going to the door, knocking, asking for someone, and then breaking in from there. While this obviously isn't like 100% like The Strangers, you can absolutely see where the line of inspiration comes from. This next movie is actually a personal favorite of mine, and that is The Conjuring. Now look, I get it, there's a lot of things that you can say about Ed and Lorraine Warren the paranormal investigators. They're known for fabricating stories, adding a lot of details to their hauntings, so that way they can sell more books. Almost being fraudulent, if you will. So as I speak to the true details of the story and the movie itself, just be aware of the fact that some of the stuff was probably dramatized for book sales. The Conjuring details a family struggle as they get tormented by this spirit, and in all honesty, their struggles living with it as the spirit gets more and more aggressive. There's a lot of really good scares in the movie, and in my opinion, I think it's a good little horror flick. As the spirit gets more aggressive, though, in harming the family, they decide to turn to Ed and Lorraine for assistance, and that's when stuff gets even crazier. In the movie and in real life, they identify the spirit as Bathsheba, but the thing is, is that they actually had no proof that this was Bathsheba at all. It was simply pure speculation. The only thing that had to go off of was, oh, there was a person named Bathsheba that died around the area oh so many years ago. So it must be this. That's evidence now? Speculation? Fabrication? Rumor? That's... Anyway. In the movie, there's many scenes where the spirit is flying people across the room and there's very potent smells of rotten flesh. 
This is actually all reportedly what happened inside the household. Lorraine maintained that practically every detail in The Conjuring happened in real life. The thing that I can identify that was dramatized was the exorcism at the very end of the movie. Ed never performed any type of exorcism on anybody. This was due to the fact that it needed to be done by a Catholic priest. Now, this isn't to say that they never did exorcisms. There were many instances in their career where they did have to do exorcisms with a Catholic priest beside them. But again, nothing was ever done by Ed. There is a claim that a seance did take place and it temporarily possessed the wife that lived in the household. This is the scene you see at the very end of the movie where like the chair levitates and the cloth that's over her is like destroyed and bloodied. And all honesty, just take that detail as you will. Take everything with this, with a small grain of salt. This next movie is an absolute classic and there's no way you haven't heard of it. This movie is Psycho. This example is actually rather funny. The writer of the book and director didn't actually intend for this one to have so many connections. It actually just sort of fell into place and kind of just happened. It's really interesting. Our story opens up with an office worker by the name of Marion. She wants to marry her lover, Sam, but since Sam has to pay an alimony, it really inhibits their ability to do so due to financial reasons. As a secretary at her job, her employer gives her $40,000 to deposit at the bank for a client. That's roughly $400,000 in today's money. After being entrusted with this amount of money, she decides to take it upon herself to steal it. She then makes her way to Sam's store in California. She believes that this is the fastest way to start over and get a new life. And I mean, in all honesty, with $400,000 in today's money, yeah, I think that's a way to do it. During the long drive though, she gets caught up in a storm and has to make a stop at the Bates Motel. It's from here where she eventually meets Norman Bates. Major creeper vibes from this dude. This guy's a little weird. And by a little weird, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The rest is history. If you haven't seen this movie, I'll try to refrain from super heavy details, but Inevitably, a few things will slip out, but watch this movie if you haven't. Norman Bates' character is actually based on the real-life killer Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the killer of Plainfield, built up quite a reputation for himself. He's known for claiming the lives of two victims, and many others are suspected, but he's more known for the assortment of goods within his household. On top of being a killer, Gein was also a grave robber and built up quite an assortment of things from the victims that he pulled out. To name a few of the things he had, he had a nipple belt, skulls on his bedposts, bowls from human skulls, leggings from human leg skin, and four noses. That's just to name a few. There's much more in this man's household. There's a list probably out there online. So with all of that being said, how are these two characters connected in any way? Well, you'd be surprised. There's actually many similarities, despite the author Robert Bloch not intentionally making the characters share similarities. And yes, I didn't misspeak there. Psycho's actually a book. I never knew this. And if you never knew it, there's some trivia for you. It's not just a movie, the more you know. Some similarities are as follows. Gein and Bates were both considered to be solitary murderers, meaning they did them in isolated areas such as rural locations. Secondly, both committed crimes only after the deaths of their mothers. And to tack on another thing, they both share odd attachments to their moms. Both Gein and Bates kept shrines of their mothers in sectioned off rooms. Very weird stuff, if you ask me. This next movie is a personal favorite of mine, and it goes by the name of Angst. This movie is absolutely different in comparison to a lot of other horror flicks out there. This time, you're in the view of the killer, not the victims. Shortly after being released from prison, our killer friend wants to get back to murdering. He eventually finds a home, and once he's inside, he slowly begins to take the lives of every other person within the household. This movie does an insane job at suspense building and like keeping it in your chest. I highly encourage you to watch this movie if you haven't. It's really good. I bet you're thinking, Jesus, what possibly could this have taken inspiration from? Well, it actually comes directly from the murders of Werner Kienznick. Well, I totally butchered that name. 
I know I did, okay? I'm sorry. I'm only human, all right? Anywho, I'm talking almost everything that Werner did in real life happened in this movie. In the beginning of the movie, he shot an old lady. That happened. Breaking into a home and murdering the three people that lived there just after escaping, not escaping, getting out of jail. That happened. Even down to one of the characters in the movie being wheelchair bound. That was a direct tie. Now, I can't exactly speak to which details were dramatized and which ones weren't, but it's safe to assume that most of the things that happened in this film happened in real life. This next movie is an absolute classic. You know it. You love it. Scream. Surprisingly enough, this is actually based on a true story. I know. The story for Scream is rather simple. A masked knife-wielding killer terrorizes a town, but mainly stalks the high school students and kills them in brutal ways. This movie is awesome. It's scary. There's a lot of comedic moments that work really well. If you somehow haven't seen this movie, absolutely worth your time. The story for Scream is actually loosely inspired by the Gainesville Ripper. Daniel Rowling, the serial killer, terrorized the town of Gainesville, Florida over the course of four days. During his time of terror, he claimed up to five lives of students that lived within the area. These serial killings actually became a major focal point for the plot of Scream. One detail in particular that really sticks out is the way that the killer posed the bodies. After getting sexual with the bodies, he would pose them in sexually provocative ways. Now, in Scream, the bodies were never set up in sexually provocative ways, but, at least in the very beginning of the film, you can see that the killer enjoys setting up the bodies to terrorize the people that are going to see it. The killer was later executed by lethal injection in the Florida State Prison. I say later as if it happened like, well, they, they charged him and then they, they got it done the next day. This guy was caught in September of 1990, but was only put to death in October of 2006. So later means later. And with all of that being said, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the video. If you feel like there was any movies that I missed, or maybe there was a favorite movie that you really enjoyed, feel free to comment it down below. Let me know. Before we hop in the end segment though, I would like to thank my Tormented Knights and my Knighted Patrons. From my Tormented Knights, we have Andrea, EB Agent J, James, Nee, Willow, Shyla. From my Knighted Patrons, we have Cherisee, Emma, Jessica, Lucas, Mary, Shizen, Teddy, Timo. Woo! Thank you guys so much for your very generous support. It really does mean a lot and it allows me to bring you all the quality content you oh so desire. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed the video, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't though, why not dislike and let me know what I can improve on for next time. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I will see y'all in the next one.